the situation are we facing in Stockton today? Well, the actual situations, as far as I can tell, have been persistent in Stockton. Uh, the issues that are uh, deeply rooted and entrenched here that have really destabilized a large part of our community and marginalized uh, several uh, you know, generations of families, including but not limited to unresolved trauma. I think that's one of the biggest, deepest issues uh, that has kept us from being able to make strides uh, in the right direction and progress beyond what our kind of reputation has been. Um, I think that there's been a lot of decisions that have been made uh, that have benefited a few at the expense of many. Uh, I think that the state's investment in prison uh, here along the 99 corridor, this is called Prison Alley, and actually uh, the state's investment in that has really contributed to a burgeoning and growing population of folks that have been incarcerated and separated from their families. I think that, uh, and you know, look no further than a budget to see the values of a city, of a state. And most of that investment has been in punishment, control, and draconian policies that were born out of disparate treatment out of, uh, for people, in particular people of color. So these are, we're, we're really dealing with, the, with the, the lingering impact of some of those uh, issues and that dark, past that isn't too distant, really. And we see that currently playing out. I think that a proper analysis would conclude that the complexities and realities of people of color, a young family, system impacted families, formerly incarcerated families, right now that there is a hope though. That's this current situation right now. We have driving forces that are really working towards advancing certain principles, policies, and practices among our folks to really deal with that deeper rooted issues that we just talked about on the, uh, and, and, but we still have restraining forces that are really uh, entrenched and are uh, kind of in a state of conflict about what does that future look like? Uh, as MLK said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We feel like we have to bend that arc and continue to advance, um, you know, that, uh, that kind of ideology. Uh, and so I think that uh, we're in a position right now in Stockton to really be an example of what happens when you actually frame investments, uh, policies, and practices around the, uh, with an equity, uh, apply an equity lens, considering the social, historical, institutional traumas, and then chart a course forward by investing in those communities that have been divested from, or if there was investment, it was in it was in, uh, in ways that really destabilized whole families and communities. These, these struggles, these, this conflict, this violence has been around a long time. Yes. And there's been a lot of organizations yes. uh, that have tried to yeah. curb it. Right. Why does it keep staying the same or why does it get any better? Why does it never get better? Well, it's a dynamic process, right? This, we didn't get here uh, overnight. It's not going to be solved overnight. It's, not a, it's a very complex, multifaceted problem. There's a variety of different variables one must consider and that's driving uh, the violence uh, and the epidemic of violence here. Number one, we as a community have normalized violence as a way to deal with conflict. We have raised young people, in particular young men of color, without uh, proper uh, support and guidance from their fathers, many of them being, again, themselves impacted adversely by decisions and, and the war on drugs. This has destabilized communities so much so that young people are unable to rely on adults to intervene in their problems. And so they take matters into their own hands. It's a shame to think that a young person in South Stockton has easier access to a firearm than to a computer. I think it's crazy that we as a society and as a community feed the world yet have some of the most punctuated food insecurity. So here you got young people, jobless, homeless, hopeless, but they got a gun. What do you think is going to happen? As they say, how do you stay clean in a mud puddle? The reality is until we come in and actually go into those communities, the fathers, the mothers, the uncles, us, these are our children. We see them, first of all. We got to see them. It's like you saw the young people, you saw them. Many times they're not even seen until they come in here. Young people have four very important questions that must be answered. Number one, am I wanted? Number two, do I have a positive purpose in this world? Number three, where do I go for guidance and support? And number four, where do I go to feel safe? 
Those are the basic questions that we as a society, as adults, we must answer. These kids are a mere reflection of the adults that surround them. These are decisions that have uh, the, the conditions that they're struggling through were not created by them. They were created by a set of decisions before them that preceded them. And so that's why here at this agency, at Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, our mission is to promote the social, cultural, spiritual, and economic renewal of the most vulnerable families of Stockton and the greater San Joaquin Valley. We show our people love and give them a reason to live with purpose. What does that look like? Well, right off the bat, when they're walking in, we acknowledge them. We thank them for joining us. We're not just another nonprofit. We're a movement. Uh, and we see ourselves as that guide, as that space where young people can know, number one, you are wanted. You are a blessing. You, number two, you have sacred purpose. Number three, you have traditions and rites of passages to guide you and support you across the bridge towards manhood, womanhood, adulthood. And number four, you are safe here among us. Uh, we will never allow anything bad to come uh, to harm our children, including uh, lies, misinformation, or half-truths. You know, we're, here we are, you know, with these kinds of different ideologies and worldviews colliding right now, both in, you know, in our in, in the state capital of California. As we struggle with the future of California, we must find ways to show our investments and our love for our young people. And we must see our young people as assets waiting to be developed, not as problems waiting to happen. And that's unfortunately what's the what we have done. We've created this. Uh, and now we need young people to trust us again as we collectively try to solve these persistent problems that have plagued us for far too long. Law enforcement has come up with different ideas through the years, and all of their ideas seem to be the same, getting yeah. more cops in the neighborhood. Right. What has law enforcement gotten wrong, and what do they need to do moving forward? Well, I'm not law enforcement. I think law enforcement uh, should, should really answer that question. Uh, I will say this. I, I will say that there's court. The sure. Well, I will say this. The data tells the story. The correlation between uh, police uh, shootings, right, uh, of civilians uh, and gun violence in our community, there's a correlation there. I think that trust is a big issue, right? We have one of the highest rates of unsolved homicides. Um, that's been a persistent problem. Uh, we have uh, a whole new force right now led by a new, uh, by a new chief. I really do feel that uh, Chief Jones is uh, really sincere in his quest to really build bridges with the community. I think he gets the he gets it. Law enforcement responds to violence. I don't know that they necessarily can prevent it. A, uh, a healthy, healed community will prevent violence. Harm people, harm other people. Heal people will heal other people, right? And we believe that right now the future can heal the past, and the chief has been very... Uh, transparent, uh, very sincere about the dark past of law enforcement's role in creating the conditions that we're trying to uh, address now. But and, and that I think takes a lot of courage because you got to face your wounds, you got to face it, and you got to actually be able to be rigorously honest and transparent about that with the general public. Uh, so I, I actually believe that uh, that we are making some genuine strides in the definitely the right direction. Uh, I look forward to having more opportunities to actually be part of a first response that we go in and triage a family. Unfortunately, oftentimes we don't see these young men and victims of violence that are in need of critical life-saving services. Oftentimes we see them as, again, as a problem or something to be feared instead of something to be loved. And something, some, uh, you know, so I, I, and we don't see their sacredness. And we fail to see the interconnectedness, right? So... And we believe that if we invest and support them, a rising tide lifts all ships. That'll, it's a transcending effect across the community. I think that law enforcement right now is, is uh, coming to terms with that. I'm, I'm proud of the work that has been done. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. Because I think at the end of the day, the most important question right now is how do we save people's lives? That's at the end of the day, the, the number one question we struggle with, we grapple with. We've had to bury too many children in this community. That's blood on our hands as a society. What does that do to a, to a land, to an environment, to a city, to a people when you're burying your babies? That's who we're burying right now. Uh, we have a funeral tomorrow for a young person that was murdered. We've had, we've, we, were, we were actually donated a coffin. We have a casket downstairs because a family uh, gave it to us after we helped them bury their child. And they said, this is for the next child you need to bury. That was perplexing to me. That was very 
unsettling, but it was unfortunately real. And we've had, unfortunately, um, to bury so many of our young people. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, and I think that as a society, we need to reconcile that. We need to, we need to, we need to find ways to really radically shift the way we do this work uh, because we should not as a society allow, uh, you know, this to continue. We, we, we know better, we should do better now. And I think the good thing right now, if anything, is that this has been such a persistent issue here in Stockton that, uh, but now with the leadership that we have, some of the electeds that are really doing some bold and courageous policy making and envisioning the future of Stockton uh, and, its, and its reinvention, if you will, uh, our role as a community is to usher this in uh, and, and any reinvention has to pass through healing first as far as we're concerned. Uh, and so I, for us, the future looks brighter than the past, certainly. The best days are in front of us as a city and we are informing the rest of the state on some level, the rest of the nation, we have one of 22 trauma recovery centers. In Stockton, I hear that 92% of the victims of gun violence over the last 30 years were young men of color. How many of them actually received critical healing services? It's been elusive. It's been out of reach for them. But we've punished them quite severely, right? That punishment shouldn't define them. Actually, I think that if we're going to dislodge the pain of generations, uh, that we need to get up close and personal. That's what gives us our power. That's what gives us, that chief, the power too, the proximity to the community. In that proximity is the power. In that is where the solutions are going to come from, from the, the people most impacted. The closest to the pain are the ones that are going to actually have the solutions to that. They are the ones that should be the drivers in charting a new course for public safety alternatives to incarceration, diversion, and reinvestment in community-based supports like this where young people, again, can have those questions answered immediately and continuously. Uh, and they have guides and supports. And as you just saw right now with the young people, they're amazingly gifted and brilliant. They are irreplaceable. They are truly a special gift to us. But do they hear that often? How many of us love our young people? The really important question would be how many young people know that they are loved? So if you don't have, if you don't, if you have a, uh, an absence of love, what does that do for our young people? What does that do to a community? So we're trying to create beloved community where young people see and hear and feel and know that they are loved. But we also believe that love and power must go hand in hand. We need to build power with those young people. We need to build power with those marginalized communities, with those communities of color that have been forgotten, uh, that have been treated with disparately, that have been uh, neglected. Uh, I think that uh, we believe in this kind of balance between love and power. Love without power is anemic. Power without love is reckless. So we build power through a pedagogy of love. And it's actually the medicine that our young people have been waiting for. And uh, again, uh, they're the metrics. They're the measuring stick. I know when they're happy and they're harmonizing and working collectively and building the collective consciousness and the collective identity, they're unstoppable. I'm, I'm proud of them. And I'm proud to be uh, one of the uncles in this work with them. What is the pathway right now? If you could heal this community tomorrow, how do we get there? We will heal this community. Maybe not by tomorrow, but one person at a time, one family at a time. And that in itself will actually transform this community. I think that until we deal with that, Eric, that, uh, that the past uh, uh, that has really, again, um, uh, created these conditions and break up those conditions, that concrete, if you will, uh, then, then uh, and that's, that's what we're going to have to do to actually, you know, be able to grow uh, the future that we desire here as a city. I think that if we, uh, if I had it my way, we would close down uh, incarceration uh, and we would open up healing centers all across Stockton like this. We would repurpose those institutions as, uh, you know, workforce development centers, uh, you know, basically um, healing centers. Uh, we do work therapy here. We have the lowest recidivism rate for the last five years. Those are their parents. They're not just prisoners. They're parents. They're not just, you know, felons. They're fathers. And I think that, um, I think that the sooner we can get them home, get them healed up, get them into the pathway and not expand the onboard to opportunities, then I think that uh, we will go a long way in actually healing the past. I think that's what it's going to take. The future is going to have to heal the past, but we need to reckon with that past. 
we need to reconcile that past. I think that any systems that have at the uh, that have proved uh, proved to be uh, ineffective at, at solving these age old problems, uh, we need to recon we need to we need to we need to they, we need to reconcile that. We need to actually address that. Uh, and we need to make sure that the investments right now, we have a monumental opportunity. Just, you know, today, later today, the select committee for the Alliance for Boys and Men of Color out of the legislator, led now by the new chair, uh, Eduardo Garcia of the Coachella Valley, is going to be visiting Stockton because, frankly, we're informing the state right now. Stockton is on a global radar. Stockton is the, is the beloved city where that's we're the underdog. We've always been the underdog city. We've, our reputation precedes us, but now people are starting to see something very amazing happening. I get calls all the time from academia, from people uh, across the, you know, uh, uh, across the nation, and for that matter, across the globe, that are looking at things that are happening here and figuring this. This is might be just very much the solution that they've been waiting for. Whether it's a universal basic income, whether it's a, a you know, a, you know, kind of work therapy services for formerly incarcerated, whether it's housing assistance and stabilizing them, whether it's, uh, you know, youth and racial justice work that needs to happen. Um, I think that uh, right now we're in a really prime place. Again, we have some system leaders. Uh, we got the chief of probation. We got the district attorney that right now are working in a very synergized way, in a cohesive way with communities uh, based organizations like ours and saying, look, you all do what you guys do well. Uh, why don't we uh, reinvest in, in, in those services, which number one, are much more uh, cost, uh, the cost benefit is, un is, is uh, clear, uh, 250,000 a year to incarcerate a young person versus uh, what it takes to heal and, uh, and develop their leadership. Uh, we're developing cooling off centers with our community based groups. We need to reinvest in these CBOs uh, to really do the work that they, they need to do and go to scale. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at this now as a community reinvestment strategy uh, to put the, our money where our mouth is. If we truly love our community, if we love our young people, uh, and we want to heal and stabilize this community, then we're going to have to invest in it. The city is in a, a good position. It's fiscally healthy, one of the right. most healthy in the nation. Right, right. Um, you know, there's more officers uh, on, you know, a part of Stockton PD than right. ever has been. Right. Um, it seems like all these things are in place. Uh, they're running, they're firing in all, all cylinders. Right. Um, we saw homicides drop last year. Right. They're shooting up again. Why do we see that ebb and flow? That, 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 I think that ebb and flow is... Um, it's typical. What it, we, you know, and I think a, a proper analysis will conclude that there was um, a moment of just like of uh, community peace that was happening, right? And I think that uh, how did they get disrupted? Um, I don't know. I haven't looked into what the trend was and how it occurred. Um, but we're back at it. Uh, we're continuing to again work with those that are both sides of the gun, right? That uh, may have been impacted by gun violence, like myself. Uh, and or have the propensity to use a firearm uh, against others and really interrupting the cyclical uh, retaliatory nature of gun violence in this community. I, I you know, the, the fact of the matter is that with the gentrification, I think part of it too, it's multifaceted, but one of the obvious things that's going on is migration is at an all time high forced migration from the Bay Area too. So we have folks that are being displaced in the Bay Area in droves, a mass exodus of in particular, people of color being displaced there and, and being forced into the Central Valley into places like Stockton. I think that might be part of it. We need to be able to welcome these folks into our community uh, and quickly stabilize and support their, um, you know, uh, them to be part of this city. We have veteran communities like Western Ranch where they have very little, uh, you know, we have latchkey kids with very little attention because people are trying to survive in this economy, right? And I think that, um, uh, and then we have skyrocketing housing. If you're homeless and cold, we started seeing a spike in homeless shootings even, right? I mean, there was like, homeless are shooting now. What? There's something wrong with some of those policies. It, accountability is a double-edged sword. If we expect our, our, our actual community to be accountable, then the systems and policymakers need to be accountable first. And that means that we stabilize housing for our community. If you don't have shelter, again, if you don't have means or way to feed yourself, if you don't have you know, access to healthcare, access to employment opportunities, access to healing services, access to community, and you're left to your own devices, 
isolated. That's the number one. The, the number one factor in dysfunctional families and communities is isolation and avoidance. What happens is that you're left to your own devices, and of course, and, and then again, you have, but you have access to a gun, right? Uh, and I think the worst thing we can do is just look the other way and ignore that. I think the most compassionate thing we can do is actually step into those communities uh, and really start to uh, shine a light in those communities and build power in those communities, uh, and build a sense of agency with individuals that come walking in our door. That's the best thing we could do for public safety. We do more for public safety than most do on a given day here. Because if they're, if they're in here receiving services, guess what they're not doing? They're not out there committing crimes. Uh, so I think there's a lot that needs to be, again, uh, considered. Uh, it's a multifaceted, very complex uh, problem that's a, it's dynamic. Um, so I think that uh, I, I would love to see some data that what were the changes? I, I would love to know what is that the root of it? Because I think that sometimes um, everyone, how is it, what is that statement that um, su uh, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan? No, no, you know, the fact is that that's all of our failure right there. What's going on? Because most of them were children. Most of them were, were kids. So what's going on? And, uh, and so I think we as an agency are committed to uh, having that hard conversation and figuring out on, on the kind of on the policy tip, what do we need to do on the community? What do we need to do and how are we going to triage and how are we going to respond uh, to the escalating violence? Um, and then what are the policies that we need to pass, though, to also make certain that we're thinking upstream and looking at the issues, systemic issues that might be inadvertently at times perpetuating this problem?